God of me, the mighty God of Israel. So now, uh, Shechem, even though he did an altar, was a compromise, and so now uh, we are leaving Shechem. Last week he was leaving in Shechem, but this morning we're leaving Shechem. In chapter 35 and verse 1, God said to Jacob, now remember we left him, he was afraid, uh, he, he was thinking, you know, this is going to be the end of me and my family, and uh, in his distress, uh, isn't God good? In his distress and in the day of his trouble, so uh, God came to him and God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And make an altar there to God who appeared to you and you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, uh, notice something very important. Uh, God is saying to him, okay, you are in trouble. You don't know what to do. This is what to do. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of your brother. Now, uh, Jacob had to do three things from that verse. He needed to go back to Bethel. Jacob needed to revisit the place of his encounter with God. Secondly, he needed to dwell there. Jacob needed to relieve his initial impressions of God. He's not, if he wants to leave, the, the first instruction was for him to go home. But then he found a place to live in Shechem, which was outside God's will. So God would say, it's better for you if you want to stop. You're not ready to go home, go and stay in Bethel. Dwell there. The third thing he needed to do was to build an altar there. Jacob needed to rebuild his pillar. Uh, into an altar and then uh, when he gets there the fourth thing he will have to do even though uh, it's, it's not necessary to fulfill his vow and by building that altar really he will be fulfilling his vow he needed to go where God wants him to go and God said to Jacob uh, earlier on to go back uh, because when God called, uh, spoke to him in Haran, God intimated to him what he wanted him to do, what he should do. Instead of hanging around and having his head down, God was saying, I am the God of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar. Now go back. So now we see, now he got himself in trouble, his family is in danger, and God said, now, you need to go back home. When he left Haran, uh, instead of going 100 miles south to Bethel, he stopped at Shechem, just 30 miles north of Bethel. Shechem was a compromise, and therefore he suffered greatly in the land of compromise. His daughter was defiled, his son's mother, or the man in a village, his family adopted the gods of the people of Shechem. And so, now that he's in trouble, God said, go back. Go back, what does that mean? Jacob needed to revisit his place of encounter with God. He needs to make a pilgrimage now. And he needs to change his position and his location. There's somebody out there. This may be just what you need to do today as you hear the voice of the Lord. You need to change position. See, where you are, where you're living, uh, it's a place where you're delaying your own happiness and your joy. God has a plan for you. The best place to be is in the center of the will of God, where everything works for you, not against you. Definitely, uh, this could not have been the plan of God that his sons become murderers, his daughter raped. No, that was not the plan. That was his plan. Shechem means personal interest. This was Jacob's plan, not God's plan. 
And this is the consequence of not being in the place that God wants us to, to, to be. Uh, he needed to revisit that place of his encounter with God. You know, it was, it, it, for somebody like Jacob, what happened in Psalm 106, uh, Psalm 106 verse 7, the Bible says this concerning uh, Israel, but the son forgot what he had done uh, uh, and did not wait for his plan to unfold the amplified version. It says, uh, the son forgot. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercy, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Uh, and he says, they, they forgot what God has done. They will not remember. They will not appreciate what God has done. They, they forgot it. Let me read another <coughs> to you. Now, instead of going back, uh, we, we notice he stayed in Shechem, just 30 miles short of where he's supposed to go. Now, how many, or oh, are you 30 miles short of God's place for you? You know, many people are just a just few miles short of their destiny, all because of personal interest. You know, shaking will always be there. You know, the allurement and the, the distraction uh, will always, you know, your, your attraction may also be your distraction and it takes you off your course. Keep on focusing on where you're going and how you need to get there. You know, there is, there is a way God deals with men and God assigns and locate a place for you. Let me say to you, you can't live everywhere. You can't worship everywhere. You can't go to school everywhere. There is a place for you. There is a place where everything around you works together for your good. And you need to find that place. You, you know, many of our struggles, many of our heartaches, many of our difficulties are all things that we order. You know, there are things that we bring upon ourselves because we'll fail to, to follow the hand that leads us. Look, all of us are blind. We're blind because we, we, don't, we don't see where we go. This is why hindsight is a benefit for us. You see, you don't see today, you don't understand today. It will be tomorrow when you look back and you see what you could have done there. Because that's how we, we live all of our lives blindly. But there is one who leads us. There is one who can guide us. It's not, a, it's not foolish to uh, uh, allow God to lead to lead us, that is called wisdom. Praise the Lord. He needed to go. He needed to be in a certain place. <clears throat> Same thing with Adam. Adam needed to be in a certain place where he enjoyed unlimited, unbroken fellowship with God every day. But one day, God could not find him there. And God asked him, Adam, where are you? Sometimes, you know, the real problem Maybe the root of all of our problem is displacement because we are in the wrong place. Let me say to you, you may be enrolled in the wrong school, you know, and things may be difficult. You may go to another place and then find things easy because now you are in the right place. See, the right man must be in the right place with the right people at the right time doing the right things. And when everything is in the place right, right, Everything will be the right. First Kings chapter 19. And in verse 9, you remember the prophet, the great prophet Elijah. Even there was a point in his life. Uh, First Kings 19 verse 9. And there he went out into a cave and spent the night in that place. Elijah was going through some personal trouble there, and he was discouraged. And uh, this prophet of fire, this, this prophet of of, of so much alacrity, so so much so much power, prophet of fire. He was going through a time of uh, down and low and, and depression, and so <laughs> and 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 then he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, "What are you doing here, Elijah?" 
God is, God is asking. And isn't it interesting that uh, God asks us what he already knows? When he asks a question, it's not for his inform information. He just wants us to, to ask ourselves. He's saying to this, this prophet of, of so much caliber and, 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 and might, and say, what are you doing here? And maybe God need me to ask somebody out there, what are you doing where you are? Or somebody who's just take their bag, you know, going, where are you going? You know, that's what God asked Hagar. Hagar, you know, yeah, he, she may have been mistreated by her mistress, or because she started it, she started it, and when things were not going well, she packed her bag and with her son Ishmael and started going, heading into the wilderness, ran out of supplies, ran out of food, and the baby was very, very thirsty and almost dying. So she put the baby over there because she would not watch the baby die. And she went somewhere. And and God, God met with Abel. And all God wanted to ask. He said, Hagar, but where are you going? Where are you going? And 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 he said, Well, well I, said, I, I know all the story, but why did you leave? Go back home. Go back to your mistress and submit yourself to her. And then look over there and God opened her eyes. She saw the well and she was able to, you know, uh, give her dying son something to drink for herself and then for the rest of the journey. Where are you headed? Are you, are you, are you heading, you know, going to board a train, going nowhere? Oh, just going out looking for a pot of gold that will never be there. Hey, stranger, where are you heading? Where are you going? Jacob needed to go back. Jacob needed to be in a place, and this is why God said him, go back to Bethel to revisit the place. But why Bethel? Why Bethel? Well, it better seem to be the prescription that God has for him in this mess that he found himself. Why better? To revisit the place of his experience. You see, it is important for the soul to feel as at force the initial impressions of God for the journey to carry on. You, you see, Jacob had had experience. But it was just long ago, almost 26 years ago. You know, the day of his experience in Genesis 28 and in verse 16 through 17, uh, Genesis 28, 16 through 17, the Amplified Version. You see, uh, he needed to revisit the place of his experience. This is why God said to him, go to, go, go to better. Because you see, uh, emotionally, and physically, J Jacob is all dried out. Uh, Jacob is dried out and, and revisiting that place. Uh, you know, there are many, many who, you, 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 when you go back to your old uh, high school or go back to where you were born and raised or go back home and go back to your village, go back, you know, there is a feeling of nostalgia. You know, the, this, this feeling uh, it's a it's a double feeling, a, a feeling of uh, you know just sudden happiness, and then at the same time a feeling of sadness for the times that have that, that have passed. You know, it, it somehow recalibrates the spirit and recalibrates the soul. It gives us some impetus for the rest of the journey, just like a little boost, a little you know, it, it brings the memory. The memory becomes active and in action again. How wonderful it is it is for us. You know, Jacob needed to revisit the place of his experience because he has forgotten. There are many of you who are down low and, you know, spiritless right now, so discouraged, anxious, and in doubt, only because you've forgotten. You've forgotten where you started from. You've forgotten the God of your yesterdays. You have forgotten your initial impression of God. When God became real to you, life 
and up and down, you know, you know, hustling here, you know, helter skelter, just to maintain this shelter, has taken away from you your initial depression. And that's why you find yourself in this in this place. Jacob needed to revisit the place of his experience. What was his experience? You know, many years ago. And Jacob awoke from his sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I did not know it. See, that's what he did not know the Lord. He did not know the Lord's presence. So he, all of his life until now, he felt something. You know, it was not what grandfather said to him or uh, his father said to him or any pastor or preacher. No, this was a personal experience. So, so he was afraid and he said, how to be feared and reverence. You see this word in King, uh, King James Version or the New King James Version, Jacob said, how awesome. Uh, Jacob had an awesome experience. Uh, awesome means something that's awestruck. It means wonder. And that is what happens when a soul really meets with God. You feel the wonder. In fact, you know, God wants us to live in this wonder. And when this wonder stops or ceases, the soul becomes dry. Do you see these wonders every day? Do you look around and see wonders every day? Wonders come in different forms. Wonders come when you wake up and you see the dew on the grass. Wonders come when you hear the birds singing. Wonders come when you see a blue sky or majestic mountain. Or you see a river running. Wonders come when you hear good news. A new child has been born. Wonders, wonders should never cease because it keeps us, it keeps us living and flowing. But when this wonder cease, our soul becomes slow and dry again. And, we, and, and that is not too far from that, my friend. This was his experience. He said, how oh, awesome. He had a sense of wonder that he has lost now. Time has stolen it away. You know, time is a thief. And it steals our sense of mercy, our sense of rapture, our sense of wonder. How we feel when God became real to us. Look, my friends, he seemed to have lost this sense of wonder. His soul fell on that night when he first talked to God and when he heard God. How awesome. How awesome in this day. You know, you know, God is awesome. And I see his awesomeness every day. Not just in my life, but when, when the phone rings uh, from anywhere in the world and somebody gives me a testimony. When somebody, I meet someone and they introduce themselves and say, look, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't remember you. And they say, well, you know, I met you so, 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 so you pray for me about this and that. I just want to tell you that prayer. That's wonder. Uh, the wonder that we see in prayer answer. The wonder that we see when we have given ourselves to God and God is blessing our life. Jacob needed to revisit the place of his experience. Not only that, why better? He needed to revisit the place of his dreams. You, you see, he had a dream. He, he had a, not, not like all those uh, silly dreams and empty dreams, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know. No, he had a real uh, dream, a dream from God. He had a dream, and when he saw heavens open, when uh, uh, there was a ladder, he saw a ladder, he saw angels, and angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And when he heard God's voice, and he also talked with God for the first time, and there he received promises and encouragement for his life journey. He needed to go back. He needed to do himself that favor to wash himself over again with this experience. Go back to Bethel. And God is speaking to somebody this morning who needed to revisit that place of experience. Many of you uh, came to know the Lord because of his mercy. You know, I know many people who were healed from sicknesses and then 
then they came to know the Lord. And, and now, you know, all of the wonder they experienced, at first, is gone, so you need to go back. There were some of you, you had dreams. You had dreams. I have met people in my life who have dreams, who are dreamers, and God gives them dreams to give them messages. You know, I've had people come to this church all because they dream. I had a man I met who was who was looking for me for three years. He saw in a dream. God showed him in a dream a man, and his wife is an artist. So he described what he saw in the dream a man, and and they had a portrait of me. And for three years they were looking. To find me. One day I was in a friend's home for Bible study. And this man kept on looking and just staring and looking. You know, I've had many people look at me, you know, wherever I am, uh, uh, traveling. Some, some just look at me because I'm a tall man. And so I'm not, I'm not, you know, intimidated or, you know, nervous when I see people look at me. But if there was a man just looking at me, well, even when, it was time for prayer. Everybody closed their eyes. And the man is still looking at me. So later on I found out, wondering why he's looking at me, I was trying to leave that uh, place to go somewhere else. And he begged the host to say, please keep him. And it, I was out the door. He came and grabbed my hand. No, no, you get away. Now wait, wait, wait here. He said, wait for what? He said, just wait until my wife comes. And uh, the wife came. And they had a portrait. They said, we have been looking for you for three years. God showed you to us in a dream. And said, go look for that man. He's a pastor. Some of you have had this kind of encounters with God. And you've let all of these other things in your life, you know, uh, you know, taking that impressions from you. God is speaking to you this morning to revisit the place of your experience, to revisit the place of your dreams. Jacob needed to go back to Bethel to revisit the place so he can remember the night of his hopelessness. Remember that night his soul was deathly afraid. God is calling him back there, impossible to remember the day he lighted upon that unfamiliar village at sunset. He came there at night and he was a fugitive, on the run, afraid and uncertain of the coming night. To remember how hopelessly uncertain he was and also to remember the riches of God's grace that gave him peace and assurance that night. Some of us have forgotten how good God has been to us. Jacob needed to go back there and remember that he was not this always sure. There was a night in his life that his soul was deathly afraid, uncertain of the coming night, uncertain of his future, but he was there that he received peace. He was there he received promise from God. And God said to him, Don't I'll be with you, and I I, I will I will guide you, I will protect you. Why better? He needed to revisit the place of his ritual for the first time in his life when he woke up that morning in verse, uh, verse 18. <coughs> we see him uh, took the stones where he had laid his head and, and made it a pillar and he poured oil on the gauge. Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stones that he had put at his head, set it up, a pillar. This was his first pillar. This was his first ritual. Why? Because he felt something that night and he poured uh, oil on top of it. Uh, yeah, he needed to revisit the place of this ritual. Jacob needed to revisit the place to remember the precious promises from God. See, you are not just here in the premises. You have promises from God. Now, uh, you know, this promises to cheer us on as we walk this tedious journey we call life. If not for those promises, you know, tomorrow is uncertain. Anything can happen anywhere. We can be living in fear right now. The only reason why we're not out of our mind, 
The only reason why we are not captivated by fear is because we have promises from God. See, Jacob needed to remember that when he left Haran, he left Haran with a promise from God. Go back home, I will be with you. So there was no need for him to make the detour. Sometimes he needed, he, you, know, you and I need to remember the promises of God. My friend, why are you discouraged this morning? Why is your soul so afraid? Do you still not trust and believe in God? Do you, have you forgotten the promises that he made? See, God is a promise keeper. He said, I will always be with you. I will be with you. Regardless, God will be with you. Why better to revisit the place to fulfill his vows to God? See, he made a vow. In verse 20 and 21, Jacob made a vow to God. Uh, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, surely I will give a tent to you. See, this vow is overdue because Jacob put conditions to God. He asked God for his presence. He has God for his protection. He had God, asked God for prosperity. And he asked God for peace. All of this God had done. The last thing to be done is to bring him back to his family. And now God says, go back to your family. Now he is the one who now stop in the way and in the way of God fulfilling. So God has done his part. Now it is up to Jacob now to do his part to fulfill the vow. Now, Jacob was not in any kind of, uh, you know, pressure to fulfill the vow. Doesn't that sound like some of us, you know, when, when, when the kettle is really hot, when, when life becomes so, so hot for us. I've heard those prayers, I've heard those prayers. Oh, Lord, if you heal me this time, Lord, I'll, I'll get up, I'll, I'll be an evangelist. Lord, if you take me out of prison and, and where I am, Lord, Lord, I, and we make these promises to God. Many of you hearing me now, you made a vow to the Lord. And some of you have not even kept it. But some of you have even turned back. You have made a vow to the Lord. And that was Jacob. He made a vow to the Lord. Lord, if you do this, then I will do this. And God had done everything for him. And yet, instead of him to be in a hurry, in a hurry to go and do his vow, he, he, he detoured, you know, and, and have a delay in Shechem. And that's speaking to some of us. You know, why are you delaying your thanksgiving? You know, why are you delaying uh, the duty for God? Then the second thing the Lord said to him, uh, not only to go back to the visit, he said to dwell there. If there is a place to stay, it's not Shechem. Because there is nothing in Shechem that will remind you of you. There is nothing in Shechem that will inspire your faith and devotion. If you want to dwell there, dwell is the word uh, to abide, to say abode, same word uh, in our edifice where we live, our house. Jacob needed to relieve his initial impressions of God. He is called to dwell in the place where he will have reminders of worship, where he will have reminders of his devotions and vow. You know, you need to surround yourself with people and things that remind you of your duty to the Lord. Things that remind you of people who remind you of your vows and your devotion. Uh, you need to surround yourself to around with people who inspire your worship, who encourage your commitment to Christ, people who fan the flames in you, people, people who will encourage you to be 
who God wants you to be. Staying and living in Shechem is being around fire fighters, uh, being around power quenches, uh, being around people who will dampen your spirit, who will not encourage your devotion to God. Stay there, go to Bethel, because when you get there, you will remember who you are. When you get there, you will remember the promises that you have made to God. When you get back to Bethel, you will remember, you know, what God said to you and what you said to Him back. You know, unfortunately, people make decisions just like Jacob did. A conscious decision, you know, to stay away from Bethel. I mean, Bethel was just 30 miles. In fact, they say it's a day's journey. All that left for him was one more day's journey. He would have been where God wanted him to be. But he was 30 miles short. He deliberately stayed away uh, from where. You know, I see that today. You know, there are some that God gave you a pastor. It was it's God who said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. Someone who, who will care for you spiritually and watch over your soul. But you know, when the pastor is too honest and, and his life is a challenge to people, there are pastors who have to apologize for the way they live. And so they don't care how you live. But there are people who inspire your devotion, who aid your commitment to Christ. And people try to stay away from those kind of pastors. You know, just like he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, uh, the Amplified Version says, For the time will come when, the, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. Uh, but wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors. The whole. Second Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 3. Now, there is safety in the path, you know. A coal that will stay hot, a bright red, will stay in the fire. The coal that stands alone will soon die out. Surround yourself with impressions and things that help your devotion and people that encourage you in the Lord. Hebrews 10. And in verse 35, uh, not forsaking uh, the assembling of yourselves together. Not forsaking our meeting together. Amplified version says, as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithful, fruitfully as you see the day of Christ return. You know, there's people who do not care about, about what the word says here, the Bible says as the manner of some, you know, that is the manner of, they don't care about, the, they don't understand that the fellowship is finding their own place. That is what God prescribed. Go back to Bethel because there you will relieve the initial impression of God. You will surround yourself with reminders of worship, the devotions, and, the, and, and your vows. You will remember. When you get there, dwell there. Dwell there. You know, we dwell at home, we don't dwell in hotels. So the word dwell means to abide. You know, in hotels you check in and you check out. And that's how some people are with God. They just check in and then they check out. They're not dwelling. Remember Psalm 91, verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Isn't it interesting and a reminder of all that we've been saying for almost seven, eight weeks now. The need for personal altar. You know, Jacob could not bring himself, you know, uh, to a, uh, an altar. And he could not bring himself to say, my God. But you see, because he, was, he had no altar, he was not dwelling. See the son say, he who dwells in the secret place of the Mosaic, that one will be able to say, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him 
I will trust. The third thing we needed to do, God's scripture is build an altar. Build an altar. You see, to build an altar at Bethlehem, Jacob needed to reveal that pillar, uh, that memorial, into an altar and then fulfill his vow. Why an altar? Uh, what is an altar? Altar is a structure which offerings are made to deities. Altar is a gate of exchange of transaction between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. A place where humanity interacts with divinity. Nothing happens in the physical realm without it first happening in the spiritual realm. Nothing leaves heaven until something leaves earth. The altar is a place of accessing the spiritual realm or a place of transacting with spiritual realm. You will benefit from the altar you're connected to. The altar releases blessings for men in the physical realm. Things are released to men from these altars. You must be sure which altar you're connected to. An altar is what God prescribed to Jacob. And could that be the answer to Jacob's many troubles? Could it be that was what was missing in Jacob's life? His overdue vows, a life without an altar, could it be also that it is the answer to your life's puzzle or even the answer for the church today, a personal altar? Why an altar? We realize and we talk about the reason why he had not made spiritual progress. So when God said these words to him in chapter 5, chapter 35, verse 1, God said to him, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob responded, and uh, we'll continue uh, this in length, maybe next week, but I want you to read verse 2, Jacob's response. He's now preparing to go to Bethel, but before he leaves, there must be some homework that he needed to do. Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourself and change your garments. And in verse 3, then let us arise. For the first time, it's going to be Eunice. He's going to leave his family now. He's telling them, do away with these idol gods. No more idolatry. Change your garments. Purify yourself. Let us arise. Go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God. There's going to be only one altar here that we will worship, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way I have gone. And the Lord sent me here this morning to tell some of you, to tell you to go back to the place where you first started. To go back and rekindle your first love. He wants me to remind you, I am the God of where you started. He said, tell them I'm waiting to meet them there. You can no longer stay away. Go back there and raise an altar or repair the altar. Go back there to fulfill your vow. Your praise is due. Your thanksgiving are in arrears, and your offerings to God is due. Will somebody pray this morning and say, Lord, take me back. Take me back to the place where I first met you. Maybe you find your joy gone, and you find your faith is not as strong as it used to be, and your love to serve God and your love for the Master uh, is dreaming. He, he sent me to you today to tell you, 
go back. And the Lord is looking for you there, to lift you there, because your vows are due. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this morning. We're so grateful for your word and a challenge from you. Indeed, many of us have drifted away from our place of encounter with you. Our initial impressions of your grace and mercy upon our soul. Many of us have forgotten how you rescued us. How in the night of that so our souls were deadly afraid. How we call upon your name and how you came just in time. Many of us have forgotten the promises we made, Lord. We made a promise, we made vows, and many of us have forgotten. We're doing better now, and so we have forgotten. We're richer now, and Lord, we have forgotten. We're healthier now, and Lord, we have forgotten. But we ask for your forgiveness, and we thank you for your unending love and your mercy that fails not. It's in your mercy this morning that you remind us to go back. And so take us back, Lord. That's our prayer. Take us back so we can repair that altar or raise an altar. This is what we ask. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. My friend, if you are out there and you have not received Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, why don't you ask him this morning and ask him to come into your heart to say this prayer with me father in jesus name i thank you this morning i come in the name of jesus and i'm sorry for my sins i ask for your forgiveness today i receive jesus as my lord and my savior lord jesus i give my heart and my life to you Please come into my heart and life today. Please, Lord, write my name in the book of life. I commit my future into your hands. And I thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. This I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. My friends, thank you all for joining us today. And until next time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.